Welcome to the Autumn 2015 Baumer Lecture Series at the Knowlton School. Uh, my name is Andrew Cruz and I'm an assistant professor in the architecture section. The relationship between this semester's Baumer Series theme of energies and tonight's speaker, Eric Olson of Transolar, should be immediately apparent for those with even a passing interest in Transolar's work. And for those of you who are not, you're in for a treat. Transolar has been involved with some of the most intelligent and most visible projects addressing issues of energy and climate since their founding in 1992. From Qatar's controversial proposal for the 2022 World Cup to the sublime Cloudscapes installation at the 2010 Venice, Venice Biennale, to name just two examples. But instead of energy in this brief introduction, I want to reflect on the question of authorship and how Transolar's involvement in a range of international projects complicates what I think we as architects tend to see as a, very straight, as, as a fairly straightforward story. The architect is the author of a building, much like the writer is an author of a book, or a painter is the author of a painting. Yet conceiving, designing, constructing, and operating a building takes a cast of hundreds, if not thousands. Movies may be a better analogy for many buildings than books or paintings, given the larger budgets and complex organization that goes into making a film. However, the analogy between building and movies is immediately complicated with Transolar because what they do does not fit neatly into an existing job category. Theirs is an elite class of engineering practices, along with Bureau Hapold, Atelier 10, and ERA, although they are not, strictly speaking, mechanical engineers. Using those wonderful German compound nouns, the full name of the firm is Transolar Klima Engineering, or Climate Engineering. Just what is climate engineering? Put aside the large-scale macroclimatic interventions like cloud whitening and ocean seeding, and instead think about medium and smaller scale meso and microclimates. These are the project scales for Transolar. They're, they're very good at asking fundamental questions and getting unexpected answers. This emphasis on exploring and exploiting fun the fundamentals is evident in many aspects of the firm. Their self-titled monograph is organized around the fundamental pre-Socratic elements of fire, water, earth, and air. Their job postings call for applicants to have a, quote, proven ability to develop and articulate novel engineering problems beginning with fundamental physics. And their collaborations with project teams of architects, of landscape architects, of urban planners, often introduces a question or idea that marks the project in some fundamental way. At the Levin Burnick Center with Vincent James in New Orleans, they ask if a building in a hot and humid climate can be comfortable without air conditioning. At the Zollerein School with Sana in Essen, Germany, they ask how an extremely thin concrete wall can be simultaneously structurally, thermally, and spatially active. And at the Dolce Vita Tejo in Lisbon, they ask if a foil cushion roof could economically provide thermal comfort, indirect lighting, and be very light in weight. Transolar's professional position complicates the clear narrative of architectural authorship but in a way that broadens the scope of the project and the purview of the design team. In the best cases, Transolar's presence on a project suggests an opening of possibilities. Conventions are to be questioned. Givens are not to be taken. The title of Eric's talk tonight, Connect Ideas, Maximize Impact, Climate Responsive Design Through Collaboration, nicely expresses this thought. Eric is a managing partner at the New York office of Transolar, where he has worked on many projects, including the Angelos Law Center at the University of Baltimore with Danish <coughs> architects. He's been a guest lecturer at Harvard GSD, Penn Design, MIT, and Columbia University. Before joining Transolar, he launched the City of Chicago Green Building Permit Project. Please join me in welcoming Eric Olson. I'm going to start my timer before I start to try to avoid going too long. And 
I hope that I can live up to that uh, most excellent uh, introduction. I have a lot of material that I want to try to uh, share tonight. And uh, I think we can just launch uh, right into it. I've already got a, a review of uh, a little bit of what Transfolar is about. Just to give you an idea of uh, where I'm coming from, first, myself personally, I thought I'd comp say how nice it is to come back to the Midwest and mention in the introduction that I'm from Indiana originally, grew up in Lafayette, went to Purdue, and uh, this, uh, was able to, really happy to accept the invitation because I arranged it with the Purdue Alumni Band, which uh, is this weekend. I marched in the band at Purdue, um, and so I'm going there and playing in the band this weekend. And, uh, yeah, we won't be doing any script uh, Ohio's, but we will be doing a large block of keys. I'm looking forward to that. Thanks for bringing me here so I can do that as well. Um, but I spend my time in New York these days, um, but we're an international office of small offices. Each office is a maximum of about 20 engineers uh, distributed among Stuttgart, Munich, New York, and Paris. And we're really just, although we're working so closely in collaborating with architects, we view ourselves as an engineering practice and mostly have engineering backgrounds. A couple of people with made an architectural background in each office. Um, and I like to start by talking about what our attitude is, especially our attitude towards sustainability. Often we're lumped into this category of sustainability and sustainability consultants. Uh, and of course, uh, one of the driving factors that we're really interested in is uh, averting climate change uh, by reducing uh, carbon dioxide emissions. But that's really the focus of how we're actually designing buildings in our practice day to day. It's the clear end goal that is underlying everything, but that's not, you don't get to the result by focusing exclusively on that. And certainly not by taking something that's inherently not green and strapping a bunch of technology or techno green things onto it, like gray water recycling and a green roof and some wind energy and claim that it's now green. So we're not really interested in that. What we're really interested in is performance through design. How do you work together to design something that from the ground up, every decision that's made is contributing to how that object will perform, but those things aren't working contrary to other goals of which beauty is certainly one, and I think that these kind of beautiful racing boats are a great uh, embodiment of that. Increasingly, I've started to describe that as also performance through delight. You can probably guess those are my kids. I think that they're delightful. Um, and the idea that we ultimately want to create delightful space that's really enhancing your life and this idea that energy efficiency and performance decisions work contrary to that is a false narrative essentially and that everything we do to contribute to creating delightful space of course is also contributing to the, the performance. So hopefully I can show you that through some of our work. Um, another way of getting at uh, Andrew's introduction of what is climate engineering you know, it takes you back to looking at the way buildings used to be designed. If you look at uh, our adopted hometown, a flat iron building around the turn of the century and other buildings, you see all those buildings have awnings. They're all shallow plans with courtyards because electricity was very expensive for light, so you needed all spaces to be daylit. They didn't have air conditioning, so of course you had to control solar heat gain so spaces wouldn't overheat and be able to have windows that open on both sides. And somehow, you know, over the course of the 20th century, we transitioned to something like this. You look at central business districts around the world, and unless I tell you where they are, uh, you probably can't really guess what part of the world they're in. Maybe Hong Kong's a giveaway with a giant mountain in the background. A lot of cities don't have that. Uh, but the buildings became somehow not so climate responsive. And of course, you can argue that that's partly due to the ad advent, advent of air conditioning and how that enabled architecture to be free from climate, and that that's true, but I also think that we could be responsible for ourselves as well as users and the occupants of the buildings. Our expectation of what buildings are about has somehow changed, that we think that outdoors hopefully still remains the friend. You probably would be, rather than sitting in here listening to me, as much as I hope that what I have to say is uh, useful, you know, enjoying dinner with some friends in this beautiful courtyard, and indoor spaces are just a place to go and learn or work and f put your head down and get things done so you can get back to that kind of condition as quickly as possible. And what that overlooks is the fact that outdoors is also the enemy sometimes. This is a fundamental 
reason that we build buildings, create architecture, is to provide shelters so that we can lead comfortable and productive lives when it's not so comfortable outside. So you have these two very different uh, conditions, and that's another way to define what climate engineering is about, is how do you take uh, an environment, climate that's continuously changing outside, and a building that you think of as a relatively static object, you know, buildings just sit there, and we shouldn't make the buildings be forced to have systems, and have it mediate with outdoor conditions when they're very extreme. You certainly don't want to experience that indoors, perhaps maintaining some visual connection. But at other times, when it's really exceptional outdoors and you would naturally want to be outdoors, bring that feeling and condition indoors as much as possible. How can we accomplish that with architecture? And uh, That's uh, another way to think about what climate engineering is about. So what I'd like to share with you tonight is some projects that I think illustrate three kind of major ideas that run through our work. Uh, and the first is creation of uh, humane spaces. So maybe spaces, again, not like this kind of space that uh, doesn't really seem to be considering the occupant that much. Uh, the, the other thing that you'll notice, at least in the first couple sections here, is something about uh, relationships and the importance for us of developing long-term relationships with the people that we collaborate with. Uh, the practice is so deeply embedded in going back and forth and talking and discussing. We usually find it takes doing one project with a new architect just to understand how we will possibly work together. Uh, and the next project becomes much smoother, but the most fun is when we develop years of relationships and continuously grow and learn from each other over that process. And there's no better example of that of, than, uh, than Banish, who's also from Stuttgart, and we have a 20-year history of working together with. Uh, so the first project we can take a look at for an example of humane spaces also is the, the law school at University of Baltimore. This is really our flagship in the U.S. It's our largest built project in, in the U.S. And uh, one of the things that makes it different from some other projects, it's very complex programmatically. Uh, so it has everything under one roof that a law school needs, which includes uh, starting from the top, a law library, there's faculty offices, there's classrooms, there's administrative offices, there's a law clinic, which I never knew existed before I started that project. Like Low-income people can come in and get free law services the same way you go to a dental clinic, you can go to a law clinic. Uh, and they even have a moot court where you have fake court down in the bottom. Um, how do you uh, resolve all of these things? The project has some different modes that many of the technologies you see mentioned here you see as a thread in a lot of our projects. I don't want to focus on them too much, but almost all these projects have different modes. So here's the a cooling mode where you're using embedded uh, tubing for active slab cooling. Uh, but all the ventilation air is delivered only into the spaces and there's no new air, no big ductwork or giant blowing air into the atrium. It's only conditioned by air transferred from all the other spaces and then pulled back to the top. And then similarly, there's a natural ventilation mode. All the windows in the building are automated. When you go into natural ventilation mode, uh, users can push a button and open their window, or in public spaces, they open automatically. And uh, again, that's all pulled by a fan, in this case, operating it, pulling it through the atrium. Um, but really, the focus for this project was on the facades and how they relate to the spaces behind, and how do we, in such a large and complex building, create this connection and uh, humane space uh, behind that facade and all those different uh, space types. And to some extent, the program is expressed on the outside with this office classroom facade, uh, which consists of a glass rain screen uh, with gaps high and low behind the actual insulated facade, and that has shading, which moves up and down automatically in order to provide protection from the sun. But when users open their window, they can pull air in through this rain screen and uh, get their ventilation. That's very different from the library facade, uh, which is just a single layer and uh, has this checkerboard pattern, which is uh, designed to give a very different appearance, but also provide daylight by always having a low operable window. And then the other half, each, each uh, set of two rows is a single floor. And so there's a low window for a vision, and then there's a high window for daylight alternating in order to create that checkerboard. So each uh, pair of checkers is one uh, floor in the building. And then it has this uh, frit pattern in order to control the solar heat gain so that the, those radiant systems that are so 
low energy can actually work because they have limited cooling capacity. And then lastly, there's the atrium facade, uh, which really uses a new daylight concept. The daylight is not coming from the top of the atrium, but coming from the north and south vertical slots that the atrium uh, provides. And daylight is traveling sideways through the atrium in order to provide daylight into spaces on either side of the atrium. This atrium is way too tall and narrow to have any credible claim at providing daylight from the top. So that's the reason for focusing on the sides. Um, so a variety of studies to make all those things work, looking at the amount of solar control, whether it works, looking at the frit, there were recommendations for how much frit was required, and then Banish designed the frit pattern with this gradient in response to the amount of frit we recommended. Testing of the atrium to make sure that with all of this transfer air providing the conditioning that would actually be comfortable and making sure that the client is comfortable with that. Uh, this new and novel thing for them to do. And in the end, this is the, the finished project. You can see those three facades kind of very clearly in the, the south elevation with the front entrance here. Um, and this is you know, over 40% better than uh, the ASHRAE energy code. The, uh, but for me, really the focus on this, you show all the diagrams, but you know, Banish is so well known for their atriums and social spaces, but they're always connected together usually with a kind of a climate concept and working through the daylight and the access to outside as well. And for me, this project is really kind of emblematic of that. And you can see now that's the north facade of the uh, atrium. How, in this case, there's lockers there, but uh, many other sp have, uh, floors have rooms there, and so that receives daylight from the atrium. Here's a classroom, and most of the classrooms uh, you know, there's many that are on corners, or if not, they always have one very major facade and are having uh, daylight levels uh, similar to this. I wish we could get the professional photographers to turn the lights off in their photos. I apologize for that. Um, and they were really anxious to get the pictures taken of this building, so the library doesn't have any books yet in it uh, when you look across the atrium at the library. But you get the idea. Um, and there's the uh, typical office. So all in the offices, there's buttons to open and close windows and so on, and put the shades up and down if you want to override what the building is doing automatically. <coughs> and for me, really the greatest story on this building, here's some of our own pictures with the terrace on the outside and looking at the library facade. When, at the groundbreaking, when the president of the university, he announced, uh, and in every room in this building, you will be able to open a window the crowd spontaneously broke into applause. This seems like such a basic, to me, almost human right, but it's so often not provided these days that they're that excited to know that they would be able to open the windows in their new building. Um, and there you can see that office classroom facade with the glass rain screen, and then this is a blind box and the blinds behind. Uh, so this was sort of the, the current high point of our relationship with, with Banish. Uh, I thought it'd be interesting just to review you know, a couple examples of how TransSolar got there. This is a much earlier project um, from maybe two th around 2000 uh, in Hanover, but this was the first uh, sort of Class A type office building in Germany to be provided only with natural ventilation. So even in Germany, where everyone thinks is the, I don't know, land of everything perfect, green and environmental, it's not the case. There's also progress there. And, uh, this was the first building to not have any mechanical ventilation at all in uh, such a high quality space. Um, and then another example, uh, really thinking about environmental quality and how that relates to technical performance is the, this spa in Bad Eibling, um, which is about how do you take, create this bright condition that uh, everyone always wants when you have uh, a spa that's going to be used in the winter, but you have to struggle with condensation of the glass and use all these horrible systems to prevent condensation by separating those programmatically so that there's a very bright and dry winter garden and then a, a very controlled, insulated, with an insulated skylight dome and uh, the humidity is contained within the dome itself with one-way airflow from one space to another. And that's very much part of the architectural concept that you have this very bright and contrasty uh, winter garden that you see behind there, and then you come into these more peaceful and diffuse uh, but still daylit uh, domes. And there's a variety of those with different temperature of water. And then this is one, we're actually working with them on four projects right now. Uh, so this is one for the future here. That, 
Uh, it's an expansion and renovation of the School of Business at Portland State University. So that, that's the existing building that's being renovated, and this is the new building. What's really exciting for us in building on all that other experience is that this, uh, the addition portion, will be only will not have any mechanical cooling. It will only be cooled by natural ventilation. And as obvious or easy that might seem in a climate like Portland, Pacific Northwest, so famously mild, as, as far as we know, it's the first commercial building in Portland that will not have mechanical cooling, or at least since that became widespread. Um, the last project, is kind of switching uh, collaborators here for the idea of humane spaces, just to touch a little bit on uh, uh, this French school in Damascus, which is with Atelier Lyon from Paris. Uh, I show this to, partly to emphasize that it's not all fancy glass boxes or other very high budget and fancy looking projects. You can accomplish the same intent on fairly modest and low budget projects as well. So this is a private French school in Damascus built with very simple materials. Um, the school is fortunately, at least partially, still in use today. If you wonder about that, how things are in Damascus, it's unfortunate that we can't go and visit it these days. But it's really, it's this climate, or this uh, campus of these pods of classrooms. The climate is a climate engineer's dream with a uh, desert swing, very high temperatures in the middle of the day, but very cool temperatures every night. Um, and so it uses that with a kind of classic night cooling strategy. During the day, the windows are closed, and there's earth tubes where ventilation air is pulled through those and that cools down the air that's delivered into the two classrooms and the whole thing is driven by a solar chimney that heats up and drives the flow. Then at night, the students and teachers, it's their responsibility to open the windows before they leave. The windows are open at night so that you pull as much air through the spaces and cool back down all the thermal mass of these exposed slabs in the building and the tubes. So, so there's no mechanical ventilation, no mechanical cooling, and a very, very simple heating system in this project. Um, this was some analysis of what the temperatures would be to see that it actually wouldn't overheat. And we love this project because the climate diagram translates so literally into the, the, you know, the built section that you see. There's these courtyards in between the buildings with some operable shading and some vegetation which provides a little bit of preconditioning of the air before it even makes it into the courtyards. The solar chimneys are, are west facing. They're just concrete block with uh, plexiglass in front. This is where the air is drawn in. So then I come to my second thread. So that if we talk about humane spaces, everything is also informed by this ap basic application of physics. I love this fun example. That's a boat of air floating in a tank of sulfur hexafluoride, which is about six times as dense as air, and therefore you can make it float just like it's floating in water, and you can sink it by pouring this sulfur hexafluoride into the boat. Um, I actually use this example when I teach of why using stack effect, which you see in these solar chimneys, is so difficult. Air density variations are about plus or minus 5%, and that's what you're relying on to drive stack effect. Sulfur hexafluoride is six times denser than air. And Mythbusters, which of course I love this show, Mythbusters did a test of this that actually is possible and they confirmed it is, but it's very, very, very difficult. They had a really hard time constructing the boat to actually float. Um, so it just shows that those six times density variations are difficult to work with. It's not so easy to work with plus or minus 5% for stack effect. So I want to show some other examples of where, going back to really basic uh, physics, uh, informs the approach to a project. And the first one is uh, Zolfrein School that Andrew mentioned in the introduction. This is uh, one of uh, several projects with, with SANA, which is kind of the next relationship that we'll see develop as well. Um, and this is a project that's about thinness, which is uniquely enabled because of the site. So the, the site is in uh, the Ruhrgebiet, the uh, Rhine Valley area in Germany. Um, in Essen, and it's next to an abandoned mine. And what's unusual about that mine, here if we see the mine, it's about 1,200 meters deep, and a mine like that has to be pumped continuously to keep water out 
so that it doesn't flood. And even though the mine is abandoned, the German government was committed to pumping it for something like at least another 50 years or longer, should they choose to reactivate the mine. Uh, and this water was just being dumped into the river. And that water is very, very warm. It's not warm enough to heat a norm normal building with, 35 degrees C, that's like uh, you know, 85 Fahrenheit. You can't, that's very difficult to heat with, maybe even 80. Um, but it's warm enough to do something with. And so we thought long and hard about how you could do that and how to uh, enable sauna's famous minimalist goals. If you know anything about sauna, they basically want to build buildings that are practically not there because they're so thin and ethereal. And that's why the end result was, rather than having insulation, to replace that with tubing that you run this free warm water through that was not useful for any other purpose but it's warm enough to keep the wall at room temperature and therefore you eliminate the need for any other heat from the building so we, we call that active insulation and uh, architects we know always get really excited about this project because they're so excited it's thin i just want to emphasize this this would be the stupidest thing anywhere else in the world like you really have to have this mine water so we have another project that's next to an abandoned mine that's pumping water all the time for another 50 to 100 years please go for it but otherwise uh think about the process and not the end result here so here you can see the construction of this exterior wall uh, with the tubing and the kind of shot of how warm that wall actually is. It's just dumping out the, all the heat that's coming out of the mine anyway. 35 or I just noticed that myself, that this diagram says 35, 35 and the, is this says 25. I believe the 25. 25 is more, 25 is more reasonable. Yeah. 35 is 95. 25 is uh, basically just under 78. 26 is 78. Yeah, 20, 35 is Yeah. Um, can you read the picture of the pipes? What's that? That picture of all those pipes, can you leave that one? Yeah, well, let me make sure you get a picture of the presentation, uh, let me get the, get the slides. Um, so there's the build product, uh, and you can see, especially when we look at the corner, how very, very thin that the concrete is. Um, so that's, you know, an example, like really going back to the basic physics. And then the cloudscapes, Andrew also mentioned, is another very, very basic application of physics, and this is also related to our relationship with sauna, because the reason that we did this project is because uh, Sejima, who is one of the two partners of sauna, was the curator for the Biennale in 2010, and she invited us to, to do this, and so we chose to design this cloud that you could walk up through and back down as a visualization of climate engineering and how we can adapt our environments with a steel ramp that we walked up and, down and back down. The steel ramp was designed by Tetsuo Kondo, which is a, another Japanese architect, a former guy from uh, Sana's office. So that's where that uh, connection comes from. The way that you make an indoor cloud, or at least the way that we've made most of our indoor clouds, because we've done other ones since this one, is by taking advantage of those density differences that I mentioned, which are not so easy to maintain since this, the density differences are not so large. And the key thing to know is that humid air, contrary to intuition, rises. Humid air is less dense than uh, dry air. So if you want to make a room full of humidity and just have a cloud in there, it's going to go up to the ceiling. And if you want to make the cloud even go above, you won't be able to do it. The solution is that, of course, hot air also is less dense and rises. So to make a really hot, superheated layer, above the cloud, so it's even less dense than the humid layer. So you have a cool and dry layer, a coolish, warmish, moderate, humid layer, and then this really hot and dry layer. Um, sounds great in theory, pretty difficult to realize in practice, and uh, this was an exhausting project for everyone that was involved. These were the first tests which were in a cabbage barn in Stuttgart. You know, they grow a lot of cabbage in Stuttgart, and the barns they store it in are empty half the year. So that's a great place to t do uh, initial cloud tests. Uh, these are some of the, the kind of first tests. I, I think that's Sejima there in the picture uh, uh, on site in Venice. There were a lot of details that need to be explored. And for example, it, it's just very hard to keep such a cloud stable. Uh, the turbulence from eddies of air and so on tend to mix things up. And you just want to stop all mixing that's going to 
destroy the stratification you're trying to... So that's the first test with the pillowcase being used to deliver the air, to diffuse the air as smoothly as possible. And the end solution was with, was with fabric ducts. That's the kind of construction of the, the ramp, which was a technical challenge in its own right because uh, you're not allowed to permanently attach or fasten anything to this historic building. So it's just attached with steel collars that go around those columns. Um, and the very thin, you can see the, uh, the columns that that thing stands on. Um, but the cloud's not visible yet, but the system to support the cloud is already being tested here. And when you look at the thermal picture, you can see the gradient in the cool temperatures at the bottom, and it's all really hot at the top. Um, same thing here. So now you can see those fabric ducts. That this, this one would be supplying cool air, and this one is supplying very hot air. And then this pipe along the edge is where the steam would eventually come out. And they're going back to, there's basically an air-to-air heat pump that there that produces cold air and hot air simultaneously. That's Nadir from our office who really got the cloud up and running. That's Tetsuo Kondo who designed the ramp. That's all the guys from Tetsuo's office after last night of getting the cloud running before uh, 5 a.m. on the opening day. <laughs> And then, uh, you know, it was just really fortunate that it was such a success and very well received, this kind of very uh, basic physical idea that it's very experiential that you can walk up through this cloud and back down. He also did these chairs. So that's up above the cloud. So the thing that you don't get from the pictures is this thermal experience of moving through something that's cool and then you walk up this ramp and suddenly it's super hot and you go back down. Um, and there were all these amazing daylight effects. So since then, we've done uh, other clouds. We did a cloud uh, for uh, actually for a stage production in the Repertory Theater in Munich. Uh, and we have, there's a cloud on display at the Art Museum in Karlsruhe right now. Um, people still keep on calling us about clouds now. It's sort of a side business for Transfolar doing uh, uh, cloud pieces. The last example then, switching collaborators for physics I wanted to review. Uh, is uh, the KFW Vestarkata in Frankfurt. This is a, a Zauerbrook Hutton project uh, which responds with uh, kind of air and pressure in a, a unique way to a very specific site problem. Uh, and again, the whole thing enabled by basic physics pressure really in this, this case. So the, the problem that was set up is this is an existing corporate headquarters campus. KFW is like a big, big uh, bank. It's, uh, Credit Institute für Wiederaufbau, Reconstruction Bank in Germany. And the, uh, this is their existing headquarters building. This is where they're building the new building. And they really want to preserve these views. And that more or less results in this massing uh, for the new building. The problem with that is when you look at it in plan and compare it to the wind rows, the prevailing winds, and there was a desire to have very good natural ventilation on the project, uh, it's parallel to the prevailing wind and makes it not so easy to get good ventilation for all spaces. In particular, the ones that are on the back side, the leeward side of the wind, they would tend to open their window and they wouldn't get anything because that's uh, in, under negative pressure. Um, so the idea that was introduced is this idea of pressure, a pressure control ring. This, this is a double, double facade that acts as a big tire around the entire building. So you have windows on the windward side that open up toward the wind, and that lets the wind blow in and create pressure inside of the whole double facade, even on the parts of the building that would have been uh, leeward. So now the whole thing is under pressure, and even someone who's on that back side of the building can open their window and get natural ventilation. Um, here you see it actually in plan, so this scalloped, uh, double facade and it's mainly opening the windows toward this side and the air even on this side flows this way and then there's an exhaust in the central core. So again with these, it's these unitized units with these, you know, then it's a, their language is so much with these colors, so these colored flaps that open and allow the air to flow in and then out. There is a mechanical ventilation mode as well. Um, this is also a fun project for facade construction because it's uh, a unitized double facade. Those are the modules that are delivered to site and set in place. You can always tell when it's a German construction picture because of the uh, blue coveralls. That's a deck giveaway. 
So all those flaps are controlled automatically in response to the wind speed and maintaining a certain pressure inside the facade. So the, the last topic that I want to spend some time on, and it looks like I'm doing uh, well on time, so that's good, is collaboration. Um, I've kind of, I've discovered over the years in doing lectures that every time I try to talk about how we work with architects and what we do, the, the very first question when we're finished is, and you can still ask this, don't hesitate to ask if I have not answered it sufficiently, is, so what do you guys do with architects? How do you, how do you work with us? What, you know, what is it like? Uh, and, it's, and it's such a hard question to answer. Um, this picture, which we've seen a couple times, we're going to come back to at the end and I'll explain. But I, I got maybe a new insight into this just this summer when we were doing an exit interview with an architect intern that we had for the summer. And she said, she had a great time, but she said, you know, I was hoping that I would witness like the, this, this idea generation or how, where these projects come from. Uh, and I feel like I saw a lot of things, but I didn't really see this uh, secret sauce or magic. Uh, and, and I told her, well, I, that's, that's interesting. I, and, and it brought me back to this essay that I had recently read, which is uh, basically by coincidence by one of my childhood idols at a period when I only read Isaac Asimov, science fiction author. So I was so excited to see him writing something about creativity. Uh, and, he wrote this thing that this, he, it seems to me then that the purpose of cerebration, he means brainstorming sessions, is not to think up new ideas, but to educate the participants in facts and fact combinations and theories and vagrant thoughts. I love vagrant thoughts also. Um, and it, basically his thesis is, you know, new ideas don't come out of brainstorming sessions or sitting and working together. Sometimes they do, but rarely do they actually? It's more about getting people from different backgrounds, different knowledge sets in one room, and sharing all of the information that is relevant to whatever problem that you are thinking about, so that everyone has a common basis, and then going away and thinking about that, and something will probably pop out of it, right? Because your ideas don't come when you're sitting in a room in an office, they come when, when, I'm, when you're riding your bike home, or when you're in the shower, or whatever. But if you don't have the background to fully understand the problem, you probably won't have a new idea. And that's a lot about how we collaborate, is simply making sure that the problem is understood in a new and a different way. And sometimes the solution then comes from us, and sometimes it comes from the architect. And for me, it's equally exciting either way. So I have a couple of very specific examples. Often, it's, you just can't really illustrate that. But here's a couple that I found where you can of how that process works. So the first is this uh, design competition that we did for a new dorm at University of Chicago with Jeannie Gang. Um, and we won the competition, the project's under construction now. Uh, this was at the very beginning, before we even saw anything from their office, us from sharing some thoughts about what was relevant for the wind and what we should uh, think about. Uh, this is some of the first uh, models that they sent to us and that we're uh, trying to respond to. Of course, by the time we thought about and responded to it, they shifted direction and sent us something else. And, that's okay, we think about that and respond to it as well. Um, it was actually a design-build project, so there was a big focus on budget. The competition was a design-build competition, and the, the actual design-build fee had to be submitted as part of it. Really, really unusual with a designer architect and made it kind of extra challenging. And kind of very quickly in that process, we realized one key problem the team was really interested in solving was, not that natural ventilation is the only thing we work on, but it's one important topic, and, uh, that was one here. And the, the, the well-known or easier way of getting really good ventilation is with cross-ventilation, and that requires some kind of opening on this side uh, to provide cross-ventilation. But we concluded that was just not possible because that would require fire dampers on uh, every single room, and it'd be prohibitively expensive. So we went back to, okay, let's try to do single-sided ventilation with window openings on just one side. Uh, that's much more difficult because the openings have to be extremely large if you want them to actually do something. And the reason you see how much talking it takes to explain all of the relevant components of the problem to arrive at a new idea already, the, the reason it's so difficult is because the window can only open four inches, right? You're limited to a four inch opening for fall protection so that you don't fall or unfortunately jump out of windows. Um, so we spent a lot of time discussing this problem. 
How do we create a facade that has large manually operable openings that are still less than four inches that fit within the budget of this project, which also deal with the fact that the, the massing resulted in some very significant west-facing facades that need a lot of shading. Well, this was one idea from their office with uh, opaque vents and trying to crank the facade so it's facing more northwest rather than straight west. Um, that idea didn't really work. That's just an example of how we think and work in the office every day. I wouldn't try to read anything into it. Um, even in the competition stage, we're already doing studies of, well, we say we need shading. How much shading do we really need on these west-facing facades for them to work? So that gives us some guidance as we're exploring the ideas. Um, and then finally, once all of those problems were clearly articulated, this was the first drawing we saw uh, from their office of the end solution, uh, which involves something that seems so obvious in retrospect, but it took us a long time to get there, is having an operable, side hinged operable window that opens inward with a fixed screen outboard of it. So the screen now provides the fall protection so that the window can open all the way and you don't have to worry about the limitation of the open area, but the screen is also providing part of the shading that we so desperately needed anyway. So you're integrating the, shade, the shading and the fall protection, and then there's some sort of the, the end design is a kind of a modern reinterpretation of uh, the uh, Gothic, neo-Gothic things that happen on the University of Chicago campus, uh, all rolled into one. There's a little bit of frit added on the windows as well in order to cover the shading. We did the analysis to show what the, the benefit of this is, that if you just had the typical solution, well, if you had double hung windows, you can only open four inches, forget it. This is the amount of time you'd open the window, and you would never open the window. It, you can only open it that way. If you have a side hinge window that opens four inches, maybe 10% of the year you could open the window and use that as your only kind of cooling source. But once you can open the whole thing, it's a good 30% of the year that you can really open it. So really showed how extremely beneficial it is to have that. And here you can see this pattern beginning to develop. And that's the uh, kind of end rendering, and that's under construction now. I hope that all students are always that excited to be <laughs> sitting on their beds in their dorms. I should have kept in here, I, the, uh, there was an older version of this rendering that speaks better to the actual process where this shadow does not match the, uh, the, <laughs> the pattern on the window, it's the, way, the way things really go. Um, there's the looking at the exterior. This is that big western facade. Um, so there's also a separate strategy which is pre pretty interesting for ventilation of these central spaces which are called house lounges. They organize their dorms into uh, houses. So each set of three floors and one bar here is a house. Uh, really just like Harry Potter houses. Um, then. So that's sort of a medium scale example that informs things that, you know, really elevationally on the building. Next is the even more detailed example uh, of, of one little component that was, we still took a lot of collaboration to get to the solution that was very important for the project working overall. This is the School of Nursing at Loyola University in Chicago. We've done a whole series of projects at Loyola University, all with, with Solomon Cordwell Benz. And this is the south, south elevation of the built project. Uh, there's offices basically behind these in a learning commons type space, you know, student study space on the first floor. And these bookends are solar chimneys um, with stair towers behind them. So this, the solar chimney is just applied on the stair tower that would be opaque anyway. Uh, and that allows the facade to continue all the way across the face of the building. Um, so that's kind of in section, the concept of some of the kind of things that you saw before with the radiant and mechanical modes. And the solar chimney works in a bunch of different modes. And that was one part of the discussion is often someone draws something like this, says it's a solar chimney, and they don't work through how it really works. So this is the, the dirty process of actually talking about what is happening in this solar chimney and how does it work in a natural ventilation mode, in a heating mode, in a mechanical cooling mode. It has you know, windows that open into it, it has dampers at the top, it has dampers at the bottom, which ones are opened and closed in different modes, how does that relate to a mechanical system, because there actually is a mechanical system, we call this a reversible solar chimney, because in the uh, natural ventilation mode, it's exhausting air out the top, in mechanical mode, it's exhausting air out the top, cooling, but when you're heating, it actually pulls air in at the top, so you get a little preheat of the air flowing behind that uh, warm glass cavity, before it goes into the air handling units. 
um, more looking at the same thing, just realizing that we could get this nice relationship with the mechanical systems. But th there was this, this sticking point that was important to the design, but we could never seem to work out, which was about the termination of this thing. So that south facade that you see in the built project, that's, that's really the, uh, the obvious solution would be you just put some grills or operable windows at the top of that solar chimney and exhaust there, but that's facing into the prevailing wind direction. Solar chimney stack effect is very weak, we just talked about, so you cannot have a solar chimney that exhausts into the prevailing wind direction. The wind will just push the air back down the exact wrong direction. So we really wanted the exhaust to be on the back side, the north side of that thing. And we proposed a bunch of ideas, you know, right relationship to parapets or caps on top in order to allow that exhaust to happen, but uh, architecturally they weren't interested in any of those. They were all unacceptable solutions, but the problems became very well understood. Um, and then finally, you know, this is the napkin sketch from the architect where he had the aha moment of how we can solve this, this little problem uh, that if here's the solar chimney and this is the stair tower, the stair tower has a dead space at the last flight of steps on the other side which are unused and he realized, oh, we can use that, that dead void space and have the solar chimney go into there and then they can do an exhaust termination that kind of meets the, the, you know, the lines that they were looking for on the face of the building. Um, it's a solution that neither of us would have arrived at independently. It's just, just the same as the, the University of Chicago window. Um, and you can see some detailing of the, the final thing. So now you see that this is actually a grill in the back of the chimney that goes into the stair tower and then you go up and out of a hidden cap out of the top of the stair tower. Uh, and you can just barely see it in this photo then, right? So there's the grill, there's the cap, um, making that whole thing work, but allowing them to maintain the lines that they were looking for on this elevation. So not a big picture, super exciting, sexy example, but those are the details that take you to actually getting these things to work. Um, the last project is a big picture, super exciting uh, project, and it's our other North American uh, flagship, that's Manitoba Hydro Place in Winnipeg. Um, so this is actually our largest built project in North America. This was uh, with, with KPMB from Toronto. This uh, started even in an exceptional way because it, uh, the client assembled uh, the team by going out and hiring everyone separately rather than having an architect submit a team because they wanted to make sure they had the very best or most suitable, uh, which is kind of very unusual. And it's a very exceptional client because it's a utility company, right? This is the Canada Crown Corporation public company that operates the uh, electric utilities in Manitoba, which is something like uh, 95 or 98 percent hydro hydropower. Um, and the building has a lot of other kind of interesting social aspects because they were in a variety of rented suburban strip style office buildings around the perimeter of Winnipeg and part of the idea of the project was to uh, abandon all of those leased spaces and relocate in a single iconic building where everyone's under one roof in downtown Winnipeg and help to uh, re-enliven uh, the kind of downtown there as well. The challenge for us is that this is another really extreme climate. This is a histogram, those bars are number of hours of the year that the temperature is uh, within each of these ranges in Winnipeg, what you see is it basically goes down to minus 40 degrees Celsius, which is very easy to remember talking about our temperature conversions, minus 40 is, Celsius is the same as minus 40 Fahrenheit. It's, it's really cold, um, but they still have your normal Midwestern hot and humid summers, so it goes up to 35, well into the 90s and equally uh, humid as any of the Midwestern U.S. Um, it's so cold that if you ever, you know, we had such a cold winter, you were able to do this in some spots in the U.S. here, this instant sublimation thing where you boil water and throw it into the air and it freezes into ice crystals. They can do that every year. That's like a, it's like a normal hobby of theirs um, in Winnipeg. And, and the Canadians, if, if they're not from winter, Winnipeg, they call it winter pig because it's for the, the coldest city in Canada. The, the amazing asset that Winnipeg has that when we discovered when we started working on the project is it may be really cold, but like a lot of cold climates, it's very, very sunny. Uh, so the chart here is comparing uh, kind of average Toronto uh, solar radiation to what's available in Winnipeg, and it's significantly sunnier. And when you look at a clear day, it's way, way sunnier. In general, for us, 
that's a really exciting thing about North America in general when you compare to uh, uh, European climates. Uh, all of North America is so much more sunny than, than our homeland in Germany. And uh, as, as you go west across North America, it just gets better and better, more and more sunny until you get to, say, the Cascades and across the Cascades, like Pacific Northwest, it's not sunny and so on, but generally very, very sunny. It's the first thing all of our German colleagues that come to work in New York for come for a year or two, it gets to be January and it's so cold, but they say it's much, much colder here than it is there. But they say, wow, it's so sunny and I love that. It's so amazing to them to experience the sun. So this product is really about how do you make this building that works in a climate of extremes and activates the city. This is what winter pig looks like in winter and it just doesn't look like the most exciting place to be and now they're going to take all their people from their, these distributed buildings and put them downtown and try to create something new. So the product was, like, was so ambitious that there was a clear charter from the client demanding certain energy performance and lead platinum and these social goals and it had a year-long schematic design phase which is just unheard of. Um, it started with about 16 different massings that were studied to some extent and then that was narrowed down to these three massings that were studied in a lot more detail. Uh, so these were named the, the Daylight Tower. The Daylight Tower is so named because north is kind of up, basically up in these diagrams and it has primary facades facing east-west so that everybody gets some direct sunlight which is so valuable especially in the winter there during the day. Um, the comfort tower is oriented the opposite way because that's what's much easier to shade and kind of control what's happening, especially on the south facade in the summer. And the solar tower, you might guess, is the, the winner, which uh, tries to capture the best of both worlds by splitting it apart, kind of minimizing your north-facing facade, and instead having the main south-facing facade where you can collect a lot of solar heat gain, being a shared space with these atriums we're going to look at. Uh, and then the actual offices are located on the east-west uh, facades, uh, but there's shading that makes the kind of uh, solar heat gain that might be a problem on the east and west uh, not so problematic. So here's the basic the building and plan. The, contrasting with Baltimore that we started with being so diverse program programmatically, this is a corporate headquarters office, and it's a, a podium topped by 18 stories of open office. Um, and those 18 stories consist of these six-story atriums, uh, which have then open office floor plates, then these double facade buffer zones on east and west, and then a separate atrium at the north that connects to the solar chimney. So take six of those floor plates, stack them up, connect them to one atrium, take that and stack it up three times, and that's the building. Um, and each of those pieces that we see in plan has a different role uh, depending upon season. So in winter, that's when you're really trying to take advantage of that solar heat gain. There is mechanical ventilation that preheats air using heat recovery uh, just a little bit so that it's maintained to a, a minimum of uh, 10 degrees C or 50 Fahrenheit in this atrium. And then the, uh, when the sun comes out though, on any sunny day, it will easily be well above 70 Fahrenheit inside that atrium because of all the passive solar energy. There's small uh, mechanical units that then uh, finish any necessary conditioning of the air and distribute it out in underfloor air distribution to uh, the actual offices and exhaust transfers into this north, chim north atrium, which are smaller, those are only three stories, and pulls down and exhausts into a parking garage. Uh, so the same piece of air is being used four times in the same in the building, in the uh, south atrium, in the open office, in the north atrium, and then the parking garage. Uh, then in the summer, the atrium becomes an, an outdoor space you cool and dehumidify air with those uh, units again and deliver air the same way. The cooling is provided by overhead radiant slab, as is the heating in winter. But now the outer windows uh, open up and you have blinds that can close in the facade so all the solar heat gain that you have on the facade that's unwanted can just be vented back to outside and doesn't make it into the space. And the air just exhausts out of the top of the solar chimney. Then lastly, there's a natural ventilation mode and the natural ventilation mode again Atrium is outdoors, but now, in addition to having the outer facade open, the inner windows uh, 
are open manually by the occupants, they all get a notification on their computer taskbar telling them, hey, building's in natural ventilation mode. And they really mean it. It's what I call mandatory natural ventilation. All the fan systems in the building shut down and people have to open their windows. Uh, and the solar chimney, the air transfers into this north-facing atrium and the solar chimney is driving the ventilation through the whole thing. Um, so those, those are the main modes. We'll talk a little bit about how that facade works and the reason that you need that shading uh, is that when you don't have the shading, that if you have an interior shade, it becomes really hot and you have to work really hard to cool the space because comfort doesn't depend just on air temperature, it also depends on surface temperature and you're sitting next to this really hot surface. Uh, so the double facade configuration has the shading and there's windows that can open to reject the heat. So this gets less warm and then you have the radiant surface that's cooling. So all the surfaces are much, much cooler and you can maintain comfort with a, a higher air temperature actually. In addition, what's unique about this project, we see all these different double facades around the world, is this is one of the only ones that has the insulation toward the outside. So it's a double glazing on the outside, single glazing on the inside, and that's the response to such an extremely cold climate. You need to get as much insulation as you can out of it. Um, so the end result of that, which uh, is, this one's harder to illustrate the collaborative process, but you can't get all those architectural pieces and parts working together without a lot of uh, discussion and collaboration. It's something that's 60% uh, better than the Canadian Energy Code. I always show this number that includes the whole building energy use because that's what's standard in the, the U.S., uh, but that includes a large d data center that's in the podium, and uh, if you take that out, uh, it's closer to about 30 kilobt per square foot, which is really pretty exceptional energy use for, especially for a, what's a, basically a 100% glazed building. When you look at this atrium, you see where things are integrated and hidden. This, uh, these benches are those mechanical units that are bringing in outside air. The units that deliver air to each floor are hidden in the spandrel areas here in the atrium. There's also this large water wall, which I didn't mention, which is the thin strips of film of water running down mylar strips, and that provides a certain amount of humidification in the winter, and it's chilled water in the summer, so it provides some dehumidification and local radiant cooling when you sit next to it in the summer. Uh, the last thing I want to emphasize on this project, though, is that uh, this idea of collaboration, uh, it, it doesn't end at getting the project uh, designed. The most successful project is very important that it continues all the way through occupancy and that collaboration can also be with the owner um, to really make sure that you get the intended outcome, uh, you know, that you have the, in, the outcome that you intended at the beginning, that you get that at the end. Um, and this is such a great client, we were really able to do that. These bars are showing the, the rolling annual energy use, you know, the, the total energy use of the previous 12 months for the first 18 months of the uh, building being open. And what you see is when the building first opened, they, when they moved in before it was really fully commissioned like almost all owners do, and the building was using almost twice as much energy as it was supposed to, supposed to be. But working through a process together of identifying all of the little problems things being on, running at night that they're not supposed to, the, the vending machines that we found used as much energy as a typical German house. Um, and solving those, we gradually brought it down so that uh, you know, within 18 months it's using less energy than was predicted and they continue to operate it that way today. So the energy use is very successful. Really almost more satisfying for me is some of the other statistics in the performance of the building that is here is such an extreme climate and they have measured operation in this natural ventilation uh, for 38% of the year for this period in 2010, 2011, which uh, and that's kind of been typical for every period since then, that they really use a, the natural ventilation a lot. And it's not because they're forcing on, on people and everyone just like thinks it's uncomfortable and sits there and uh, bakes or freezes. Uh, it's, in fact, it's really the opposite. They've also looked at their occupant satisfaction and compared to, they still do have maybe a few other offices in other places and comparing Manitoba Hydro Place to other offices, their hot cold calls are way down for that building compared to kind of other peer buildings. So look here, it's about half. And they also found that the way moved into the new building that they had one and a half less sick days per year. So uh, it seems that people really like living in this building as well. 
So that's very, very satisfying coming back to this idea of humane spaces that people are excited to be able to go to this space every day. Just a look at the exterior of the facade when it opens up. And it, besides these little taskbar notifications, I really like about this project that it visually expresses on the exterior of the building what is happening climatically with the building and that when it changes modes, it's totally obvious that the entire facade transforms because you go from a flat facade to something with this pattern where everything opens. And that's also a cue to the occupants sitting on the inside. If you're the guy that sits next to the window, and then suddenly this happens and all the windows are open, you might think, oh, I think I'm supposed to open my window now because their windows are manual on the interior. There's a smaller atrium uh, in the podium. This is just the stairs that interconnect uh, within the large atriums. And then, uh, of course, the solar chimney was you know, workable here because they really wanted an icon for downtown Winnipeg as well. So we're able to create something that's a bit of a landmark or, you know, flagpole in the ground and make it part of the performance of the building as well. Uh, the, the last thing I just want to kind of touch on in collaboration, our other form of collaboration is through teaching, you know, that in order to, I mentioned how I, I really start to see that a lot of the way that we collaborate is by making sure we all have the same information. Uh, a lot of us, we have many people with teaching appointments at different universities around the world. For me, one of the best compliments, and we've actually had this before, is we're working on a project with a new architect, and then he says, uh, he said, every time you guys uh, show up, it seems like we all learn something. It's so really satisfying. Um, after our 20th anniversary, we asked a lot of our friends what we should uh, do next to kind of enhance that. They told us, well, you need to do even more teaching, but you need to address the uh, majority world, as it's called. You know, Rahul Mehotra uh, uh, coined this term rather than saying developing world or third world or something, majority world, because it's where the majority of the world's population lives. Um, and so we chose to start this Transolar Academy, uh, which is a program for students that are recent graduates of universities in majority world countries, and they come to Stuttgart all expenses paid for, uh, for a year, and we give them training in our craft. Um, so we've had students from uh, Iran, uh, Ethiopia, Egypt, India, uh, Colombia. We had a this year we had a, a mechanical engineer, an HVAC engineer from Colombia, who left his wife and one-year-old child at home in Colombia to come to Stuttgart and learn for a year, which I was really amazed that he would do that. And he had designed a hospital in Colombia with all mechanical ventilation and he came because he wanted to learn how he could not do that and instead do the same thing uh, with passive systems. So kind of really mind-blowing and inspiring to have teach, be able to teach these people to see what we can learn from them as well. It's just an example of then they do a sort of thesis project and uh, we're starting the third year now. This is the, uh, one of the projects from the first year, a student from Cairo and he wanted to uh, create something to reactivate the roofscape of Cairo, which is totally unused, and bring in more vegetation. So he tried to make this uh, uh, system that's very deliberately very simple for somebody to build, well, where they can build this thing on the ground, fill it with plants, lift it up, and they can occupy the space underneath this vegetated thing somehow in Cairo. So it's fun to see what they come up with. Um, I, so just to close, you know, we've talked about this kind of climate engineering and how we collaborate, and this image that I've shown a few times is just a little inspirational piece that we, we use to remind ourselves of what we're trying to do. And we use when we ask this question, connect ideas, maximize impact, which is, uh, was the theme of the symposium that the Academy was a result of, where we ask the question, we do all this work that uh, we'd like to think is significant or that there are at least lighthouse projects that people look up to and want to emulate. If people try to copy it, that's great, so we'll do more good projects around the world. But in the end, only something like 2% of buildings in the world are designed by architects. And uh, we work on whatever, a meaningless fraction of those. So what is our real impact in uh, averting climate change, for example? And that's what the question connect ideas, maximize impact. How can we further connect ideas to increase our impact in the world? We ask, and that's why we decided to start the academy. And we have this kind of uh, uh, bio-inspired uh, 
inspiration for that, which is these uh, fireflies in Tennessee that uh, is really a big deal in Tennessee. You can go and uh, witness this. I've never seen it. It's on my list of things to do now. That they don't, this is not a long, extremely long exposure photograph. So they, rather than flashing randomly, at a certain time of the year, I think during the mating season, uh, somehow these specific fireflies, they all flash in sync. So it's like the whole forest is lit up with fireflies going like that all at once. So somehow they're smart enough that they really maximize their impact. Oh, that's my turn. What's that? They're imported from Thailand? So I learned something new. You can tell me more about it. They, uh, they, uh, they, uh, I'm not sure about that. They, uh, somehow they connect their ideas to maximize their impact. So we find that inspirational. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I know that they exist in Asia as well. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. Of course. Yeah. Do you have any questions for her? I have two quick questions here. Uh, I guess it's on quick. Hey, uh, thank you for a very nice lecture. Um, one is about the consequences, of implications of your work for professional practice, and one is about your theory of things. So. Okay. Do you use airflow a lot? And I, do you model, do you have a, um, a uh, simulation? It, dep it depends a lot on context, I guess, on what the, the question is. So the question is, like, how do we model airflow or simulation? Well, does it like, matter? Well, like, for example, when you change from the vertical exhaust because the car takes it on a cap to the, through the staircase, right. there's a potential for some turbulence which could change. Right. And that might have changed the net gain. Yeah. Do you need to model that or not? I, something like that, I would say no. In general, I say like there's there's two broad answers to that question. One is the level of modeling is uh, dependent upon how critical it is to the building's operation. That's a mixed mode building. It has a mechanical ventilation system, so you know if you can use the natural ventilation for one percent less, it probably doesn't really matter, and it doesn't really kind of warrant detailed study. No, and I well, yeah, because we if if there is any impact, it probably would be so small, it just doesn't matter. I mean, you could imagine. But, the, so there, are, the, the, there's, there are other times like so. That's yet another answer is the magnitude of just from our experience or engineering judgment, how much impact we think it will really have. And that's like the first call is just what do we think? Do we think this is important or not? The second is this. How much does it will the will the building fail without it or not? Because that the Damascus project, for example, anything that has only natural ventilation, right. it becomes a lot more important because the building won't work without it. But lastly, is the level of modeling. Just I want to address that because you see so much CFD. Everybody loves CFD. Colors for directors, right? Like fancy color and pictures and so on. Most ventilation problems, especially if it's about bulk airflow through the building, how much air mm -hmm. am I going to get from? point A to point C do not need to be answered with, with CFD. You can use simpler tools that are more uh, appropriate and easier to couple with a thermal simulation, for example. And CFD is most useful when you want to look at the air distribution in one room. Um, and we do that all the time. I don't remember if I showed any. I did for Baltimore. I, I mean, this is shortly. At what point do you think you're within a range and then you can let the architect decide about whether the value of the architect Mm -hmm. It's a good enough performance, and so right. it's up to him, or maybe it's up to the client about who prefers a better performance and wants to overrule the architectural design. Um, I would say there are times when, uh, so th there are times when it's clear like it just doesn't have that big of an impact, so we don't bring it up. Uh, the times when it's important, then it maybe comes into two categories. I'm sorry, I love to ca categorize things. It should have been a taxonomist. It's like. Uh, is uh, that there are times when it's like, you know what, this, this will not 
work. Unless we do, you, we, we agreed really want to do it this way, but unless we choose from this solution space, and it's very much about not defining one solution, but you need to choose within this solution space for it to work. And then that that's often results in our doing a variety of parametric studies in order to identify what the solution space is and the architect can choose from within that. I would say very, very occasionally right to the client, does it go back to the client that the client would get to overrule the architect? Like, uh, I can see that happening, but... You're in that mostly negotiating with the architect. Yeah, well, and our relationship is with the architect, so it's pretty difficult to so, go over them to the client. <laughs> Technically or philosophically? <laughs> yeah, your philosophical model cover. In other words, you speak of a humane space and you use, you use a generic model of human comfort or you use a local regional model of habits of comfort. Is comfort in Portland the same as comfort in Baltimore? You For show basic comfort ideas, you don't introduce humidity or relative yeah. humidity. I guess there's, for, for thermal comfort specifically, like, we generally don't use models that uh, give different comfort according to climate. A lot of the research shows that it, people adapt to or the, that it doesn't vary so much. Um, it depends more on, say, what the temperature was the last month. Uh, that, that definitely affects you, but if, you, if I moved to India and then I adapted to that, it doesn't matter that I'm not from there. Um, well, you used to that before air conditioning. Yeah. The, uh, well, partly because the, the, the strategies to address it were different. Like ceiling fans are a great example. Like ceiling fans are still pretty common in the south and they're pretty well known here. In, in Germany, because it just doesn't get hot and humid there, they do not have ceiling fans. And, and this is, I just, sorry, I have all these stories of what, you know, what we learned, what we learned from our, our colleagues. Uh, you know, a German colleague who came to New York and he said, well, I thought these ceiling fans were the stupidest thing. Like, that's a design failure. Why would you need a ceiling fan? And then he went through a New York summer where we still keep our windows open as much as all in the office. We have ceiling fans, of course, in our office. And then I said, oh my god, these ceiling fans are fantastic. Of course you need ceiling fans. It's not a design failure. It's to, it's to help the space work better. It totally changes perspective. It's interesting because you're competing with other assisted buildings. You know, so you have a Well, we're also using a whole set of technical models of comfort which are more holistic and which are even recognized and recommended by ASHRAE, but nobody uses them. But we use them. Great. Other questions for Eric? Okay. How do you control the temperature in the vertical layers? Well, that the the idea is that by having those three zones, that it will, as long as you don't have a lot of other air movement in the space that will make them mix, that they will stratify, because you have the hot air, which is one density, the humid air, which is one other density, and the cold air. And they'll, they just they sit on top of one another. That's there's the, the uh, air to air heat pump, so a big air handler that pr delivers the cold air by a fabric duct to the uh, bottom of the space, and the hot air by a fabric duct to the top of the space. And then there's the pipe that introduces steam at the humid layer. Other questions? I know I saw another hand starting. Yes. So, from the Chicago door context, the amount of humidity that you can open the window, like the distance that you can open the window and the screen facade, um, it would be part of the, of the design. And, um, I'm just wondering how, like, what portion of that project at the end of the day is designed by the architect and what part is designed by the engineer and what that, like, the collaborative process. Right. Is it, in a sense, a wholly engineered project? I, I'm no, I don't think so. I think that 
that comes back to Andrew's question of authorship, right? It's like, uh, we, we, pose the pro we, we agreed on this goal for natural ventilation, and we posed this problem that we need to get very large window openings and talk through all the possible solutions. And in this case, it was, you know, it was someone from the architect's office that came back with the idea to use the screen and said, hey, what about this? And we're like, yes, you know, yeah, that does it. And then, then we have to work through all the, then we still do the modeling of like, is that screen enough shading? And is that window large enough? But now the basic idea is there. But they would not have had that idea if we had not brought them to the place they needed to be in order to come up with the idea. Does that answer your question or not? <laughs> I think it's really interesting how like, the initial studies um, have obviously initial form studies and not really really just um, create a problem site and the organization to the Mm-hmm. I'm just curious to see how resolved it becomes in the book office. Yeah. Like in that, for that project, for example, there were uh, you know, we had some, some formal ideas, especially about getting wind into courtyards and so on, but, uh, you know, they, those are not really visible in the massing. I, you don't see a big, you don't see our hands so much in the massing because there were, a lot, there were other factors driving it so strongly about how the scale of this very large dorm would relate to these build, three-story buildings across the street and trying to negotiate that together with the site planning and circulation through it, and they, they struggled so much to incorporate that that, that that's what determined the massing. Sure, yeah. They were all from here. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, just a quick question about that. So, the screen really made that window 50% operable, right? Yes, yeah. So, that was, that, that's interesting. So, okay, the second thing is we're extremely jealous of both the, you know, of your clients and the, and the amount of money you get to spend on your projects. So, your tech, it seems your technology is, I mean, like the, Double, the double window and wall uh -huh. and the German bank building. I mean, so you must work on very expensive projects to, to implement the technology that you use. Is that true? I think it varies a lot. The uh, that's why I wanted to show Damascus very much because it's expensive to it, That's just because the Damascus the, the Damascus project is very very simple, and we've have a few other projects like that too. One in Palestine. Um, I mean, like the Cairo roof. The uh, yeah. yeah, the uh, Manitoba Hydro is was around four hundred dollars per square foot, which is kind of pretty much the going rate for corporate headquarters. And a lot of our, you know, more than half of our work in New York is is university buildings, and most of them are in the range of three to four hundred dollars per square foot, which is is usually the going rate for those kind of buildings anyway. So I think we tend to get on to there's a but project, certain project type that has a certain available budget and it's enough that you can do something, but the budget isn't being driven by our work. And we certainly are on some projects that uh, don't have quite such high budgets as, as well. Sometimes, you know, we don't show them as much because we get really excited about showing the, the, the most architecturally ambitious projects. Well, I guess that's why I'm saying is usually in our work it's not like doing a, a sort of classic engineering economics evaluation evaluation of payback of things is not the focus. Occasionally that happens, but usually it's not. Transolar recommended this as part of the energy efficiency strategy, and it's increasing the budget and has you can assign this line item to it. Often it's so integrated that you can't even take things apart because this, this is the concept that they came up with for the building and sometimes when, on the very glassy buildings it's because everyone wanted a very glassy building and it's like okay then we need to make that as efficient as possible. What is my second part of my question is we're also very jealous about um, the, you know, the sophistication of your clients and that they, and that they use, that they operate these buildings in the way that they were intended over a long period Years or something like that, and that they're still being operated that way? 
Uh, some of the uh, many of the German projects yeah. certainly have, you know, like Deutsche Deutsche Post, the Helmut Jahn Deutsche Post uh, project is a pretty well known yeah, known one that's been open for a long time. The, uh, what's that? <laughs> The, uh, you know, all the, the projects here are for like for five to ten years they're all too recent you know all of our major work in, in the in the states is in the last five six years Manitoba Hydro has been open five years and that was the first project on that sort of scale in North America at all and of course they continue to operate that extremely well so that's the, the longest one in North America is about about five years. We're both from Indiana. Yeah. So have you ever seen her follow a recipe twice the same way? Uh, I do all the cooking. So that's what's, <laughs> that's what's going to happen to your building. Uh, well, that's, but to answer your question, I, the experience is mixed. You know, some clients are great. Manitoba Hydro is fantastic. We have some others that Loyola. We have the five projects at Loyola. Uh, no, we have four that are built and two that are almost finished with construction. Um, well, and post occupancy instruction. De yeah. Depends a little bit on the depends a little bit on the building, but uh, maybe we should move the conversation. <laughs> yeah. I had one brief question of the audience before we go. Are there any engineers out there? One. Okay, thank you. All right. Thank you, Eric. All right.